A very good afternoon, Namibia, and welcome. We are live at the Government Information Center. Um, I will be your moderator for today. My name is Olivia Fikameni, and we are joined by our panelists. So first, first we have Ms. Naita Nishekwa, Director of the Directorate of Pharmaceutical Services, Ministry of Health and Social Services. Please, welcome. And next we are joined by Dr. Lee Monique Anderson, She's a veterinarian at the Central Veterinary Lab, Directorate of Veterinary Services, Ministry of Agriculture, Water and Land Reform. Next, we have Dr. Caroline Karus Oas. She is the Deputy Environmental Commissioner, Ministry of Environment, Forestry and Tourism. And last but not least, we have Dr. Victoria Amutenya. She is a pathologist uh, at the National Institute of Pathology. So welcome. Today we are going to be having a brief discussion on the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. So Namibia is joining the rest of the world and celebrating the World Antibiot Antimicrobial Awareness Week, or WOW for short. So this is a week or an awareness week that was initially set up by the World Health Assembly in May 2016. And the aim of it is to provide awareness on antimicrobials and antimicrobial resistance to the world. So without further ado, we would like to begin. So um, once again to our panelists, a very warm welcome. Now the very first question uh, would be to Dr. Anderson. Uh, so we were talking about antimicrobial resistance, and that is the main aim of uh, today's discussion, correct? So uh, can you just please give us a brief description or a brief uh, definition of what antimicrobial resistance is? Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. So antimicrobial resistance basically is the ability of a microorganism to persist or to grow in the presence of a drug um, in which it was previously sensitive to. So that basically means that the drug used to work and used to um, prevent it from persisting or growing, but now it does not anymore. Thank you so much, very well. All right, so uh, Dr. Amutenya, just a very quick question. How does antimicrobial resistance affect the tripartite ministries? Um, I think that, that question can go to Ms. Naita. All right, no problem. Sure. Uh, Ms. Naita, would you like to answer that? Okay, um, I have no problem answering that question. Thank That's you for great. that. Um, antimicrobial resistance, I'd like to even go beyond um, the tripartite ministries. I'd like to discuss maybe even how it affects the 2030 agenda, the Global Development Goals. When you look at those goals um, uh, aimed at developing, um, assisting the countries develop themselves um, and reach sustainability, you'll find that most of those goals are dependent on the performance in health. Um, number one, when you look at the goals to do with poverty, um, poverty eradication, you have to look at um, how does affordability of medicines affect um, person's uh, 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 poverty indicators, right? So if you can't afford your medicine, if you can't afford your health care, then um, it could drive you into poverty if you have high medical costs that you have to cover as well. And then we look at um, providing a healthy, healthy workforce as well. For any of the development goals, you have to actually have a healthy workforce. And we are, we are saying that um, we, um, as a doctor explained earlier, you have treatments that previously used to work and now can no longer work. So that means that your likelihood of curing any ailments that your workforce is suffering from is lower. Therefore, you'll have an ailing, ailing workforce as well. And then we also look at um, the issue of uh, maternal and child um, mortality, infant and uh, ma um, maternal mortality. Um, all of those, the, the well-being of the infants, most of them determine on, are determined by the efficacy of antibiotics, because most of the diseases they suffer from require antibiotics for treatment. So you are looking at that as well. So there's quite a lot of um, progress and development worldwide that is contingent on us maintaining the um, ability of antibiotics to function. 
All right. Well, that was uh, very insightful. Thank you for that, Ms. Naita. Um, I just want to ask Dr. Anderson. So what role does the day-to-day -day farmer play in the fight against antimicrobial resistance? Okay, um, so when we look at our farmers, mm -hmm. um, I guess it's not the same one in the medical side, but our farmers can basically go out and um, purchase antimicrobials at times without consulting a veterinarian. So they make use of antimicrobials um, themselves and they oftentimes use these prophylactically and because they acquire these antimicrobials without um, consulting a veterinarian, they, not all the times, but often so, they end up administering these antimicrobials at dosages, um, at, not at recommended dosages or intervals, and they also do not store these antimicrobials at um, conditions which would safeguard their efficacy. So. If we look at the fight against AMR, we believe that our farmers, at the end of the day, are very much part of the frontline defenders when we have to fight AMR, because they are often the ones to administer these, but we call for, um, we call for responsible use of these antimicrobials, and also we um, call out to farmers to either seek expert advice when they do so, um, because that is our, from our side, agriculture side, I guess that's one of our ba um, biggest problems that we are facing. Um, it's between our farmers, because veterinarians don't often go out to do the treatments ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I guess for now that's okay. Can I add on anything if I come to think of it? Just. In a few minutes. Of course, you can add on anything at any time. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, Dr. Arus Oas, I have a question for you as well. So, um, you see, the environment dimension of antimicrobial resistance has received a comparatively less focus than AMR in human or animal health. What role does the Ministry of Environment play in antimicrobial resistance? Um, thank you very much um, um, for the question. I, I didn't get your name there. Olivia. Olivia, nice yes. to meet you. Thank you very much for having me. Sure. Um, maybe just also to contribute to what um, Dr. Anderson was saying here, yeah. we need to be able to be distinctive when we talk about microbes, for example. It is really um, a vast um, dynamic of forms. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about pathogens or disease-inducing or disease-causing microbes or microscopic organisms, um, be it prokaryotic or eukaryotic, like prokaryotic like bacteria, archaea, like eukaryotic like fungi, um, even proteus, for example, malaria ca uh, causing anopheles, for example, that releases plasmodium that causes malaria. So we need to really look at all of this um, in a very holistic, um, holistic way. Um, just to maybe start off with the origin, we need to uh, perhaps go back to what the environment is. Um, the environment is basically a complex system of um, about four spheres. Um, the, lethal, the lithosphere, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, and of course the atmosphere. So um, the interaction of those various spheres together, especially with the biosphere or with the living organisms, um, that's what makes an ecosystem. So we have two subsets which, which are terrestrial and of course um, the water um, um, subsets. So, with taking that into consideration, our um, country embedded um, environmental protection or the integrity of these ecosystems in our constitution, um, specifically Article 95, which speaks of maintaining these various systems. And with that, various um, pieces of legislation emanated, which of course, one is now within our mandate, which is the Environmental Management Act of 2007. So um, section 27 of that Act 2B, subset 2, B, um, speaks of um, 11 activities that cannot be carried out without an environmental clearance certificate, which um, speaks ranging from um, water use disposal to agricultural processes um, to industrial processes, etc. 
Um, and then also in that same act, we are speaking of competent authorities or organ of states um, from section 30 to 32, whereby we are engaging, identifying and engaging various stakeholders or OMAs or ministries as we are sitting here on, very, on, in, in, on any of those activities. For example, if it has to deal now with affluence and whatnot, we deal with um, the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, that is, of course, the custodian of the Water Act 1956, um, the Water Resource Management Act in, of 2013, which is an amendment currently. And, of course, the Public and Health Act of 2015. Now, if we have to engage the Ministry of Health. So that's how we engage and then regulate the various aspects of the environment. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Aris Oas. I'm saying it right. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, All right. So uh, I just want to find out what are the sources of AMR in the environment, such as the communities, healthcare facilities, pharmaceutical manufacturing, mm -hmm. and animal and crop production. Right. That's, it's still be. Oh, okay. Of course. Um, so, like I said, the environment is very complex. So everything interacts with each other. Everything is interconnected, interrelated, and interdependent. Okay. Interconnected, interrelated, interdependent. So, for example, we have various uh, manufacturing um, industries, for example, that manufacture various um, pharmaceuticals. Um, um, and and at, at times, we have discharges wh which have high concentrations of these pharmaceuticals that when they go into the environment can actually um, induce um, ARM, ARM, for example. Um, there's this process called natural selection where everything changes through, ch through time or generations. But certain aspects of mutation is even enhanced through the introduction of various compounds into the environment. Um, and then also indiscriminate using of antibiotics, for example, like I said before, we are not just dealing with um, bacteria, we are also dealing with viruses. Although they are non-living organisms, they are at times called microorganisms because of their size. They are um, nanomicrons, for example. So we deal with um, disinfectants, we deal with antifungals, we deal with antivirals, antibiotics, um, and all those various things that go into the environment that proliferate a certain community of organisms that can cause um, problems in the future and also add to ARM. Um, basically, but yeah, as, I, as I'm thinking, as you said, um, I will get to it, but um, yeah, runoffs and all those various things do induce um, pathogens in the environment and of course, um, not just agriculture as well. Um, sometimes, of course, when you have um, herbicides, for example, that is sprayed onto plants and, or crops and what, what not, not all of it is assimilated or not all of it is actually um, being, uh, is toxic. Some of it is left on as residues. So that, that residue could be ingested by human beings and perhaps with that ingestion, then the natural microbes could be affected that they um, sort of, um, not amplify, but the, that, that end our resistance quality is induced. So it's various factors that come together to bring about um, ARM. Thank you. That, thank you so much. Um, I believe the public is learning a lot because we never really thought about the environment in that way. Because, you know, I said before, when it comes to antimicrobial resistance, we're usually talking about um, humans and uh, how uh, uh, antimicrobials affect humans and so forth, but we never really take into account uh, the uh, aspect of the environment and how taking care of the environment is taking care of us as well. So thank you so much for that insightful um, brief statement. Uh, just uh, one more question. What are the benefits of addressing uh, the risks of antimicrobial resistance in the environment? Like I've said before, starting off from the origin of what the environment actually is, yeah. we as human beings, through industrialization as, and as we have evolved, have tried to find ways and means to survive. And one of those means is displacement of land. One of those means is to prolong life through antibiotics, for example. They are important, but if you use them indiscriminately and not as prescribed, then of course you are adding some type of danger or, dis or disabling the role or, the, or, or, the, the, or what the baseline was before. Um, so we are here to keep the, the environment as it should be, or at least close to what it should be, or at least mitigate the effects of whatever activities as human beings we are doing. So in essence, it is basically um, prolonging the existence of humanity, if I could call it that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Anderson, uh, how can we 
support responsible antimicrobial use in animals? Okay, um, I would again start with our farmers to begin with. Um, as we said, these are our front lines. So, joint, we could all um, start by making people aware of why it is important to start with um, prevention rather than ending up using the antimicrobials in the first place. So let's shift our focus to preventing, um, preventing disease and needing the use of antimicrobial in the first place. But nevertheless, we could also go ahead and we could um, create awareness of how to use these antimicrobials in animals. So we would start by encouraging um, our farmers to by all means try to always reach out to either a veterinary professional or a paraprofessional. And when you do so, um, you can use this information instead of just going straight to a supplier, which oftentimes we, end up, we in the agriculture sector, unfortunately our suppliers and um, the pharmacies which supply these over-the-counter drugs to our farmers are oftentimes not veterinary professionals. So um, in that case, there's no one really, um, yes, they know the principle of antibiotic usage, but not per se in the animal body. So we could support that by advising farmers and having everyone um, follow the necessary guidelines. Seek expert advice when necessary. Um, seek for a diagnosis. Reach out to your veterinarian. Um, after that, you could um, obtain your antibiotics and then administer them, administer them accordingly. And why this is so important is because of the two-way relationship. Um, humans, um, whatever we administer to our animals, somehow would have an effect on us. And whatever resistance does build up in these animals is because of our actions, because we are the ones who administer these, um, these antimicrobials to these animals. So when we do so, um, the resistant uh, microorganisms would, um, the resistance builds up in the animal. But like I said, it's always a two-way because humans are in constant contact with animals or if not so, they always end up consuming um, the animals. So either directly or indirectly, these bugs could be transferred over to the animals. And so because us um, in agriculture, the antimicrobials, um, the classes that we use in animals are oftentimes the same ones that are being used by humans um, when treating, say, bacterial infections. We use the exact same antibiotics, so the resistance could start in the animal um, and then end up in the human. So it calls for all of us humans to come together, create awareness why it's so important. Start by doing things right. We um, reach out for expert advice after first trying our very best to prevent, first of all. And by preventing, I would say, Again, as humans and the farmers, we are all one. Um, we start by prevention me uh, measures, by um, improving biosecurity on farms, vaccinating. Again, where you, where you are unsure, seek expert advice, and we can take it from there. Um, that would, I think, somehow cut out on the problem that we are facing currently. On the other hand, um, we could also try to make people understand more. So I think people have a, a better understanding on how it works on the human side. Um, and sometimes, especially our farmers, are not very aware that these same services are available on the animal side. So another thing that we could do um, to help in this fight against AMR would be for our farmers to, after seeking um, veterinary, um, they seek veterinary expertise, our veterinarians, whether private vets, whether state vets, they can have these samples sent in because we are not, um, speaking now from the side of the laboratory, we are not receiving enough samples to have, to do testing in, um, for resistance. So we would like to encourage both our state 
and private vets at all times where you see necessary and where you are uncertain in a diagnosis. Take your sample, send them in. Um, we do identify um, my, my, microorganisms, we do identification, we test um, for resistance, and this would help, again, in our fight against AMR, and it would be a guideline for you um, in the treatment plan that you have planned for these animals. So, in that regard, we would basically restrict farmers, or not restrict farmers, but we encourage the farmers, instead of making their own diagnosis, jumping and administering antimicrobial use, before that, at least consult your, your veterinarian. The same way we would do it when we do, um, when we do in medicine, you place it in your doctor's hands, they take it from there and they guide you how to use your antibiotics. So, yeah, I, I think basically that is how we could do. Awareness, come together and we encourage sensitivity testing and identification in our treatment plans. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. I believe you raised a very important point about seeking expert advice to make sure that uh, we are not just um, doing things um, out of the blue because we s clearly, uh, uh, from the discussions so far, that it's clear that uh, there are detrimental effects to using uh, antimicrobials in animals or even humans uh, when it's um, uh, uncontrolled, right? All right, so the, this question is an open, it's an open question to all the panelists. So um, I believe we can start with Ms. Naita Nishekwa from um, the Minister of Health. So what policies have been implemented from each of the three ministries, um, in this case from the Ministry of Health, uh, to respond to the growing threat of antimicrobial resistance? Okay. Um, thank you for that question, uh, Olivia. We... The national medicines policy, which is um, the one that governs the implementation of um, the medicines policy, <laughs> yes, which governs the um, implementation of uh, measures put in place um, on controlling issues like AMR, for example. So in the policy, we have uh, some statements that are promoting, for example, the multidisciplinary um, committee that is to be uh, set up um, to, to basically spearhead the stewardship programs for MR. This multidisciplinary team would then involve all three um, line ministries um, as part of engaging um, the AMR uh, stewardship activities. But within that, we also speak about the measures that, um, policy statements on the measures that the ministry itself can take, um, take on for AMR. One of them is uh, using the, the tools that are given to us by the World Health Organization. Like for example, the aware classifications for antibiotics. Um, what the policy promotes is that we include that throughout our treatment guidelines as well as our essential medicines list. The policy also speaks about, um, it actually highlighted curtailing, uh, curtailing um, antimicrobial resistance as one of its um, key areas for technical support. So we are saying that when we engage partners, uh, donors and line ministries in terms of um, how they can assist us in implementing the policy, this is one of the key areas that we've highlighted. And I believe that will go a long way in um, um, addressing or at least bringing Ministry of Health's part in terms of combating AMR. Thank you so much, Ms. Nishekwa. Mm -hmm. um, so Dr. Anderson, from your side, um, from the Ministry of Agriculture, Water and Land Reform. Um, so what policies are in place? Um, so at the moment, we have not put a policy in place per se, and we are basically just going according to our national action plan against the antimicrobial um, resistance. So that is basically what we are following. Um, in agriculture, we also don't, or on the veterinary side, we don't have our own act per se, so when we do um, follow treatments and regarding medicines, we follow the uh, Medicines Regulatory Act for the, for the Ministry of Health. So the only um, supporting, um, um, let's say, legislation in this regard would be um, where we have a prevention for undesirable residues in Meat Act. So that is basically what we do follow um, to help us um, 
to control what we do use in animals um, and ultimately to support us in our fight against AMR. Um, yes, that is basically what we have been doing. And then we go ahead um, in our field. So for us, again, it's a little bit different. So um, our approach to this, we, um, we have um, inspections being done to go out. We need to do um, reporting for AMO usage coming from our farmers. So basically, it's again in, uh, in their hands, but we urge them to keep a book where they do report to the, um, to the veterinarians when they do come for farm inspections. So yeah, basically that is what we do. There's no per se policy in place at the moment. Um, we just follow and we are trying to implement our national action plan. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Arus Oas, um, why has the Ministry of Environment, Forestry and Tourism, uh, what policies have uh, you implemented to address the growing threat of uh, antimicrobial resistance? Right, like I've said earlier onwards, um, we work with the environment as a whole. We don't work with um, specifics. Okay. Um, and uh, that's why we engage the various stakeholders, for example, um, the Ministry of Agriculture, like I've said earlier onwards, or the Ministry of Health when we deal with projects or activities um, that um, have an effect on any of their policies and whatnot. Um, of course, and then also um, we, we deal, we have a division called Pollution Control and Waste Management, and as we know, pollution goes hand in hand. Um, with the proliferation of um, various microbes, for example. Um, so we have what is called also the National Solid Waste Management Strategy. It does not deal directly with ARM, but of course it is something that can be used to approach um, waste um, through step-by-step um, -step and adding value to, to what is called waste or redundant material. Um, that can also, of course, be used by um, bacteria um, to cause to aggregate for biofuels, uh, for bio, sorry, biofilms, for example. Um, so, um, so it's it's that we work in a um, holistic perspective. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. If you are just joining us, we are live at the Government Information Center and we are talking about the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. So I would like to remind our viewers that we are opening the call lines uh, so you can call in and be part of the conversation. So for those on our social media platforms, please feel free to raise your questions in the comment se section of our MICT Facebook page, which is the Ministry of Information and Communication Technology Republic of Namibia. Also, you can join us as we're streaming live on YouTube, which is simply MICT Namibia. So we are opening the uh, call lines as of now, and you can call in, by the way, at 061-400-397. 061-400-397. All right, so uh, we continue as we wait for um, our callers to come in. So, um, well, we have a caller. No, 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 go ahead with your people. All right, um, as we wait for that, uh, Ms. Amuntenya, can you please tell us from your point uh, what policies uh, have been implemented to respond to the growing threat of antimicrobial resistance? Um, the Namibia Institute of Pathology, we work closely with the Ministry of Health. Since we are doing the um, identification of clinical samples, so we try to um, provide the results of the organisms that are cultured from um, um, samples that are sent to us for patients that have possibly um, infections. And then that result, make sure that it's correctly interpreted and it's um, um, given to the clinicians so that the patients are put on appropriate antimicrobials. So we also form part of the um, antimicrobial stewardship committee with the Ministry of Health, which um, promotes appropriate use of antibiotics. So there is a multi-disciplinary uh, approach looking at pharmacy, clinicians, um, and also in terms of infection control um, in hospitals to ensure that once um, a multi-resistant organism is isolated, those patients are, um, are kept in separate rooms and contra-precautions are um, applied to ensure that the 
um, organism doesn't spread in the unit. And also just to um, add on that, we just supporting and providing um, adequate results or correct results um, to the clinicians to make sure the patients are, um, are, are treated appropriately and also advising them on antimicrobial use. All right, thank you so much. Uh, just a follow-up question, uh, Dr. Amutenya. How are laboratory professionals helping in the global fight against antimicrobial resistance? So the laboratory professionals are very critical, especially when it comes to the human aspect of AMR. So we get clinical samples for patients that are coming in with a possible infections. It's our job to ensure that those specimens are, are processed appropriately and identification is done correctly. And then we're performing antimicrobial um, susceptibility testing, ensuring that correct measures are put in place to make sure that we get accurate results. And that information is given to um, the clinicians for the patients to be given appropriate antibiotics. And then also we are involved with um, infection uh, prevention and control nurses or staff to alert them on any uh, antimicrobial resistant organisms that are um, identified in the laboratory. So that's also very critical. And then also um, being championed, um, if you're working in a lab, you have seen organisms that are isolated in antibiotic spectrums that um, are detected. So it's your job as a lab or any user to educate other people on antibiotics and antimicrobial use. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, just a reminder to the viewers, uh, if you are following us, we are streaming live on our Facebook page, the Minister of Information, Communication and Technology, the Republic of Namibia. On YouTube, it's MICT Namibia. And our phone lines are open. You can simply dial 061 400 397. 061 400 397. All right, uh, we are busy with Dr. Amutenya. Uh, just another question. What was the impact of COVID-19 and the challenges currently facing the lab in identifying and addressing drug-resistant pathogens? Okay, so with um, COVID-19, since it was a new virus and also patients that were presenting, it wasn't always easy to uh, differentiate between viral and bacteria co-infection or superimposed um, bacteria infection. So a lot of these patients were started um, on the onset um, on antibiotics, um, even if there was no evidence of bacteria infection. Although now looking at studies done in a lot of um, high income countries, it was about a third of uh, patients that had COVID um, infections that had also had either bacteria or co-infection or they'll get a superimposed um, bacteria infection. So that has definitely increased antimicrobial use um, during the COVID times then because every patient was just started on antibiotics. And also the other aspect is that um, there were no clear guidelines on how to properly manage patients with COVID. So then they will just be empirically covered in case of having an, a bacterial infection to cover for that. And then the challenges uh, facing the laboratory in terms of um, diagnosing AMR, I think it's just um, infrastructure. So you need to have um, instruments to be able to detect antimicrobial resistance in the organisms that you're culturing, um, as well as um, the personnel. So people need to understand that when you have, when you do like antimicrobial susceptibility, when an organism is resistant to this, it's uh, resistant and this information needs to be given to the clinicians to act appropriately. Also the other aspect is that a rapid diagnostic um, is necessary because um, with the, the culture, the current culture that we're using, it takes about 48 hours to get a result out. So if we can just um, make the rapid, have rapid turnaround times of maybe like four or five hours to give the result out so that um, action is taken earlier on and not wait for 48 hours, uh, that would be great. So that's some of the challenges that the lab is facing. All right. Um, another question. So how far has the problem of antimicrobial resistance developed over the years from a laboratory perspective? So I, we, we see now from 
uh, if we look at like 20 years ago, a lot of organisms that would be isolated in the laboratories, very sensitive organisms, or your wild, tribe st wild type strains where it doesn't have any antimicrobial resistance, so it's sensitive to all the antibiotics that's being tested. And with over the years of um, antimicrobial overuse and misuse, there is definitely an increase in antimicrobial resistance because of the antibiotic selection pressure of organisms. So when you use antibiotics, you kill off um, or organisms that can't handle that, and then you're leaving uh, organisms that are able to proliferate or they change the mechanisms, so they adapt to the presence of antibiotics. And then that has increased over the years with the use of antibiotics. And also the other aspect is that there isn't a lot of new antibiotics coming up and also takes a lot of years for new antibiotics to be developed. So the current antibiotics that we have now are not being very effective because of the AMR and we are soon going into a post-antibiotic era where we will see a lot of patients being killed by infections that could have been prevented by using antibiotics because of the AMR development. Thank All right. Um, one very final question, Dr. Amutenya. Yes. What role do diagnostics have in managing the challenge of antimicrobial resistance? So it's very critical for a laboratory to be able to detect antimicrobial resistance in a laboratory. So it comes from a patient presenting to a healthcare worker with um, a, a complaint and then specimens need to be taken so that they are sent to the lab and once they get to the lab, um, the laboratory personnel then take samples and process them. Um, to culture the organism if it's a bacteria and then performing um, sensitivities. So that is very crucial because then if you can't um, isolate the pathogen and uh, perform antimicrobial susceptibility, you will not be able to pick up your antimicrobial resistance in bacteria. So the laboratory comes um, in that aspect that it needs to correctly identify the pathogens or bacteria causing infection or virus causing infection, and then for bacteria to perform um, antimicrobial susceptibility that will then guide the clinician to put the patient on appropriate antibiotics. But that also doesn't stop there. We also need to continue with um, surveillance, so to look at what organisms are we culturing and how is the antibiograms looking. So that um, can also be implemented in terms of guidelines um, that are done in hospitals. And then also just to um, ensure that um, surveillance is continued and IPC and all of the measures are put in place. In laboratory, if we can um, provide um, a rapid and accurate results, we'll definitely fight AMR. Thank you. All right. So uh, from what you've said, there is hope. We can definitely fight antimicrobial resistance. All right. Uh, Ms. Nishekwa, uh, what role do policymakers play in the fight against antimicrobial resistance? And how can the tripartite ministries collaborate on this? OK. Um, thank you for that question. Um, hopefully, we've, we've started on it in the earlier question. Um, but I will continue with it. So at policy level, I think it's really just important to promote um, the measures that have been put in place by the, by the global health, um, health environment. Um, we want to promote all the researched interventions that, ca that are put in place from that level at um, national level as well. We find that there's a lot of research being done on how to curb AMR and so forth, but um, we are failing, I think, to allocate resources not only finances, but also human resources to the um, fight for, um, against AMR. So I think we need to really um, look at how we can shift um, the focus or perhaps add more focus to AMR from the um, policy level. And then I think also we also need to um, amp up our awareness, amp up our awareness um, on AMR and um, how we can curtail it at each at each ministry level, I think I'll allow everyone else to speak on it. But from Ministry of Health, for example, one of the measures that we are, we've put in place, I've touched on earlier, is looking at the aware classification. What we are doing there is we are trying to say that um, WHO has identified which antibiotics would uh, pose less risk in terms of use 
two um, resistance forming. So we are trying to increase the use of those. And then WHO has also identified which antibiotics we need to, we can use, but we should use carefully. Um, in order to curb antimicrobial resistance. Um, and then there are also those that we have to reserve use for later. So when we follow those kind of um, guidelines, we, we, we are surely to, to go quite far in that, in that area. Um, I also just wanted to speak on the impact of AMR on the health ministry um, as a whole. What we usually um, see is an increase in treatment costs, um, but we underestimate the effect that AMR has on that, or how, how much um, of a culprit AMR is in the increase of health cost. Um, we were talking to uh, Dr. Mutenya earlier, and she was telling us about the, um, the lab and how they're identifying more and more resistant um, organisms. What this translates to is that um, diseases that we usually treat with what we call first-line treatment, which is usually something that is much cheaper, um, something that is used for a shorter duration. It doesn't require um, IV and hospitalization on all of that. So we've, we are now moving away from those treatments and moving towards more expensive treatments. Not only the drug itself, the medicine themselves, but also in terms of the health infrastructural cost. Now we have to send samples to the lab, which is quite costly. We have to hospitalize these patients for five, six days more than what they usually would have been hospitalized had they been able to be treated, had the organism been susceptible to the medicine. Um, we end up having to go to salvage regimen therapies, which are very expensive and also hard to procure. Um, the ministry is also looking into something like um, universal health coverage. And the more uh, money we spend, um, because of AMR, the less money that is available to expand the um, health package to other conditions so that we can actually attain universal health coverage. So these are, these are quite, um, quite uh, heavy challenges that we are facing, that we really need to direct policy towards that. And as I in indicated earlier in the earlier question, um, we have policy statements in our national medicines policy. It was actually recently approved by cabinet in July, and we've actually started implementing it. Um, and it touches on those areas um, very well. And so we are hoping that um, with the accompanying implementation plan um, of, those, uh, of that policy, we'll be able to make some headway in tackling AMR. Thank you so much, Ms. Nishekwa. I hope um, everything that was said here is really uh, clear to the viewers because this is quite important as we, our livelihood is at stake because this is clearly a battle between us and the microbes or, and if we are not careful with how we handle them and how we treat them, uh, we could actually get to a point where we may lose this battle. So hopefully everyone understands uh, where we're going and the awareness that we're trying to bring to the public or the world at large. Uh, so Ms. Nishekwa, where antibiotics can be bought for human or animal use without a prescription, the emergence and spread of resistance is made worse. All right, so what measures have been put in place to ensure that antibiotics for both human and animal health are not accessible without prescriptions? And also, what barriers are preventing the implementation uh, of these measures? All right, thank you for that, Olivia. Um, I think that's a very important question. <laughs> I think most of us understand the um, impact of the black market, especially with regards to antibiotic sales. Um, one, of the main, one of the main challenges here is that um, the public perception out there is that you can't treat or you can't get better without taking an antibiotic. And unfortunately, that perception has spread not only from human health, but also to animal health. So the um, Namibia Medicines um, and Related Substances Control Act um, that is implemented by the National Medicines Regulatory Council states that you should not be able to access medicines without it going through a, a, um, a, I want to say a, <laughs> a qualified prescriber or authorized prescriber and in turn an authorized dispenser as well. So both, both of these measures are in place. However, because of the overwhelming um, or underwhelming ratio between healthcare worker to the population, which is um, quite low, both on the side of the prescriber 
as well as on the side of the dispenser, we find a situation where most people find it easier or maybe even cheaper to go past those two um, uh, um, blocks. But what we are saying is that the legislat legislative infrastructure is there. The law does say that you do need to have a prescription for it. And what is preventing us from actually not implementing, because we are um, the Medicines Regulatory Council is um, uh, impl implementing it, but the problem is just the overwhelming demand by the patients to access these items. And of course, it's very lucrative on the black market for you to get a hold of these items and end up selling them. So the, the legal framework is there, um, and implementation is basically impeded by the shortage of healthcare workers to actually support the legal framework um, and I mean, we find cases where you have uh, farmers who are using antibiotics just to promote the growth of their animals. And that is something that is actually not, not allowed. It's not supposed to be happening. Um, and you have, um, we understand that about 70% of antibiotic use across the world is actually in animal health. <laughs> so it's not even the, human, the humans that are using this. And the law is obviously um, there in place, but it's, it's, it's very difficult to control. What I understand from the registrar, um, I was discussing with her earlier as well, she's indicating that they are going to start with stakeholder engagements specifically about that, because they noted that it is a challenge um, implementing those measures. And um, I understand that they will soon come up with something tangible to, to tackle this, this big problem. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Nishekwa. I believe you mentioned a very important point because um, a lot of the viewers or a lot of um, the public always uh, have this general feeling of, um, I do not feel like I got the right treatment without an antibiotic. However, antibiotics are not always necessary because sometimes you can get better on your own. So I think it's important that we really understand how uh, vital antibiotics are and how uh, they should only be used sparingly and in very specific conditions. So if you go to your doctor next time and you do not get an antibiotic, please do not demand for one, but rather um, ask them perhaps other ways that uh, can help you feel better because uh, clearly from this discussion today, we've established that antimicrobial resistance is a threat to global health, it is a threat to humanity, and if we are not careful, like said earlier, we could lose the battle against the microbes or these superbugs that we are busy uh, training and Five they can minutes. defeat us. So, ladies and gentlemen, with that, that is all that we have time for. Uh, with me, Olivia Fikameni, uh, that is it. And please make sure to follow uh, our MICT page and um, on, so on our social media platforms to continue being part of the Government Information Center conversations. So that is all for me. And once again, to our panelists, thank you so much for the information. Uh, I really hope that the public uh, or the viewers out there got to understand what antimicrobial resistance is. Hopefully, we have spread the message uh, on antimicrobial awareness. And with that, thank you so much. Bye for now. <laughs>